Weapons of war don't come cheap, and the U.S. has sent billions of dollars worth of weapons to Ukraine. As the Ukrainian counteroffensive continues, more may be needed. It's not uh, a partisan criticism to say that withholding support risks extending the war unnecessarily and increasing Ukrainian costs uh, unnecessarily. It's a really tough going, and this is really uh, the toughest fight that the Ukrainians have had up till now. Uh, the Russians are very dug in. They've built very extensive fortifications. The U.S. has recently told the Netherlands and Denmark that it would allow them to transfer F-16 fighters in their inventory to Ukraine. But any future transfer could be months away, which is far too late to have an impact on the current counteroffensive. There is a difference between promising something, delivering something, and using something. And there's probably not a more clear case study for that than when we're talking about aircraft. Are more high-tech, high-priced weapons the answer? There is no conventional weapon that is a silver bullet in Ukraine. There is no immediate panacea. Well, what comes next? I mean, the Ukrainians are clearly going to make progress over the coming months. But what happens then? In the fall of 2022, Ukraine took back a huge chunk of land, shocking the Russians and the world. Kyiv may be a victim of its own success. The counteroffensive of spring 2023 hasn't seen the same rapid advances. These multiple layers of defenses, trench lines, anti-tank traps, and minefields. And let me be clear, like this would present a significant challenge for any force that is trying to take it without uh, the full scope of Western capabilities like air power and the like. It's trying to fight your way through kilometers of very dense obstacles, including mines, but not exclusively mines, is very difficult. Russia had time to set up defenses before the most recent Ukrainian counteroffensive, which they put to effective use. This is about as hard as it gets. Think World War I with drones. I mean, that's, that's a little simplistic, but that's a little bit what the Ukrainians are facing. And so in our microwave culture here in the United States, we want results yesterday. But that's just not the way it works when you're confronting a military like the Russians. Here are some ways that the Ukrainian forces could try to get through those defenses. One, you go around them if you possibly can, but that's rarely possible. Secondly, you blow your way through with explosives, but you can generally not carry enough explosives to blow your way through kilometers of obstacles. The third way is to push the anti-tank ditch in with blades, whether armoured bulldozers or blades on the front of tanks, or you can lay an armoured vehicle laid bridge. The ability to lay landmines by using artillery and special launchers has also hindered Ukrainian advances. It's part of the reason the Ukrainians are seeking to destroy as much Russian artillery as possible, not just because of the high explosive rounds, but because of these scatterable mines, it fires behind you in the lanes you've cleared. Every time you clear a lane, you've got to keep it clear. Otherwise, follow-on forces, logistic forces uh, will also be at peril, and you can be cut off in those kind of circumstances. Ukraine's shift from Soviet-era doctrine to Western-style combined arms warfare has not been easy. This is hard. I've done it. You know, I've co commanded a combined arms brigade, and I mentor brigade and div level. You know, this stuff is really, really difficult for even the best armies in the world, like the U.S. Army. So, you know, I think our expectations are unrealistic at times. And uh, this is just, like all combat, a really hard drudge that's going to have to be worked through over the following weeks and months. I just say too that, you know, for those who expect some speedy offensive, you know, uh, just remember, Ukrainians die every single day trying to do the best they can to advance. It's not like they're not trying. It's not like Ukrainians aren't dying here. They are making progress, but it's not, it's not a football game. One expensive but capable weapon system that Ukraine hasn't received yet are Western fighter jets. A used F-16 can run an estimated $13 million. But a large deal for new F-16s can be even more pricey. A recent sale to Jordan was $4.21 billion for 12 aircraft and support. What purpose does it fulfill on the battlefield? 
So let's ask that with the F-16. The F-16 and fixed wing fighters uh, more generally really do three things. They conduct deep strikes or air interdiction strikes. They provide close air support, strikes against enemy forces that are in close proximity to friendly forces, which is difficult depending on a variety of factors. And they shoot down other aircraft and drones and things like that. A jet that's been talked a lot about and the Ukrainians have actually told me that they are really interested in and have been interested for many years is the Swedish Saab Gripen, which really was designed for this very mission. It can take off dirt roads, short runways. It was literally designed to confront the Russian Air Force. It can operate in dispersed fa fashion as well. So it's a much better jet. The issue is that it's not available in huge numbers. The reason that Ukraine really needs Western jets, whether it's F-16s or some other type of jet, is that they're running out of airworthy airframes to fly on their own uh, from the old Soviet stockpiles. They've been using them pretty aggressively, flying them very low, putting a lot of stress on these airframes. They've sustained some losses as well. Kyiv's push for more and better weaponry could also reflect the desire to keep their battlefield casualties down. All modern weapons are expensive, but nothing's more expensive than losing the lives of your soldiers. So uh, there's no good commander out there on the Ukrainian side or in the US military that wouldn't expend an expensive munition if it didn't save the lives of their soldiers, sailors, marines or, or airmen and women. Weapons provided to Ukraine, like the Patriot Surface-to-Air Missile System and the National Advanced Surface-to-Air Missile System, or NASAMS, and the missiles they fire can cost into the millions of dollars. A Patriot Missile System, built by RTX and with missiles made by Lockheed Martin, can cost over $400 million. The NASAMS, made by RTX and Kongsberg Defense and Aerospace, a Norwegian company, can run $285 million for a complete system. Is it frustrating when you're spending, you know, I think $3.5 million per a missile uh, to shoot down something that maybe cost $20? Yes. But I would encourage us to think not so much about the cost of the thing that we are shooting down, but the cost of the destruction it causes. Right? What are the long-term implications and medium-term implications of the damage that thing in the air is doing? Ukraine is a massive country, second largest in Europe. So they're having to trade off, do we defend cities and critical infrastructure versus do we deploy these at the front lines where the Russian Air Force, particularly their rotor aviation, has been much more aggressive. Some have argued that more fighter aircraft could take the pressure off the already overloaded air defense systems. Whether it's the F-16s or the Gripens are going to fill some of that gap. Uh, their ability to kind of keep the Russian Air Force at bay, whether it's a fixed a aviation, fixed wing aviation, or their helicopters, that's the main purpose. The, the idea that they would be able to achieve air superiority uh, over their own skies is really not a reality. Ukrainian pilots have already begun training on F-16s with European air forces. The U.S. has assured the Netherlands and Denmark that it would expedite future approval to transfer F-16s in their respective inventories to Ukraine. The F-16s available to both countries to donate to Ukraine are older models. Both nations are moving on to the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, which means that it is an opportune time to divest their F-16 fighters by donating them to Ukraine if they choose to do so. But it will take some time to transfer these aircraft to Ukraine with trained pilots and the maintainers to keep them in the air. A Ukrainian spokesperson has said that they do not expect to get F-16s this year. There are other ways to accomplish what an F-16 would accomplish, often with less of a onerous sustainment and logistical burden. Now that is not an argument to say we shouldn't provide F-16s because uh, F-16s would create additional dilemmas for Russian military planners and Russian military forces and, and I think we should seek to create dilemmas for Russian forces wherever we can. The question is whether that is what Ukraine most needs right now and my answer to that question is no. It is not the thing that they most need now. But I hasten to add that over time the Russia-Soviet origin fighters in the Ukrainian inventory are going to be destroyed or going to get to the point where they can no longer be maintained and are not safe for flight. Cluster munitions are weapons that release many smaller submunitions to scatter over a larger area. They've been criticized by human rights organizations because the duds, or munitions that do not explode as designed, can maim or kill long after the weapon is used. This has led to some outcry over the U.S. decision to provide 155mm artillery cluster munitions to Ukrainian forces. And this conflict is not happening in a vacuum. There are landmines. Given the options available, reasonable options available, unless Russia leaves Ukraine, 
And until that happens, we have to use the resources that are available, and that includes cluster munitions. One, the U.S., of course, uses cluster munitions, so it's quite hypocritical for us to say that, we, well, we can use it in our wars, but our, our friends and partners cannot. Um, and two, uh, let me be very clear, uh, without cluster munitions, Ukraine would run out of ammunition. As Ukraine burns through artillery and ammunition, the need to meet the moment against Russia is overcoming moral considerations. This really tracks back to a lack of investment in artillery production overall in the last 30 years. Um, and at the end of the day, the Ukrainians need artillery ammunition, and this is really the last major stockpile of 155 ammunition that's out there in Western militaries, particularly in the United States. So it's not like they have a lot of choice. They actually have very little choice. So the only option for them to continue this offensive, to be able to have ability to um, really battle the Russian artillery uh, in a more balanced fashion was to give them cluster munitions. There was no other choice. Let's be clear, we're confronting the lar largest invasion in Europe since World War II. We need to recognize that core American interests, core European interests are at stake in the outcome in Ukraine. And folks in Beijing, Tehran, and Pyongyang are watching. Well, the one thing that I think has been missing in the conversation about what Ukraine should do is uh, really a focus on their own defense industrial base. They've had extensive capabilities in their own industry to manufacture munitions, to fa manufacture missiles. That's something that uh, in my visits to Ukraine, I've really not seen as much focus on as I think there, there needs to be. I think the question of whether or not big ticket items are making a difference for the war in Ukraine against Russia really comes down to two things. It's our understanding of why the war is happening and how the specific items we're talking about relate to that root cause of the conflict. These weapons uh, are not silver bullets. There's no such thing as a single weapon system that will provide that. It's when you have lots of different weapon systems in the air, on the ground, um, you have operators who are technically proficient, and then you're able to undertake the collective combined arms training. That's when you have a really war-winning capability.